Well, hello everyone, good morning or good afternoon or evening, wherever you happen to be. Um, my name is Monica Kraft and I am uh, very happy to be with you today to give you an update on uh, where we are with uh, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. Um, I am a uh, professor of medicine at the University of Arizona and chair of the Department of Medicine and also deputy director for the Asthma and Airway Disease Research Center. But I also wanna introduce my very good uh, uh, colleague and friend, Dr. Joshua Lee who will be uh, uh, giving this talk with me. He's a clinical associate professor in the Department of Medicine and also a Banner Health Physician Executive. And Banner is our uh, clinical partner at the University of Arizona. And so we thought it would be a really great idea for us both to be with you today. So we can talk about the biology, the diagnosis, what are some things we're doing really to not only prepare, but to really take outstanding care for our patients, uh, and, and preserve our, our valuable provider workforce. Josh, do you want to say a few words? Yeah, thank you so much, and uh, greetings to all of our colleagues. Uh, very, uh, very proud to serve in Dr. Kraft's department, um, uh, but primarily here to also share some uh, frontline experiences of how we're uh, taking the science and uh, making it real in the deployment across the health system. As you know, we're this shared enterprise between University of Arizona um, and Banner Health. So. Without further ado, I think we're going to go through some science today, but uh, we'll also try to inject some uh, practical uh, experience from the front line. Just want to remind people we do have the chat open. Uh, it's my job to be the chat catcher, and I'll be uh, peppering Dr. Kraft with important questions uh, as they come on the screen. All right. Thanks, Josh. That's wonderful. I think I'll go ahead and move ahead. I wanted to mention a few sources that I used, uh, so that we used to prepare for this talk. This is not an inclusive list. And I really want to thank Chip Schooley from the University of California, San Diego, who uh, gave me a lot of great suggestions for this, uh, for this talk today. All right, so just that we're on the same page around nomenclature, when I we talk about SARS-CoV-2, I'm actually talking about the virus that causes COVID-19, which is coronavirus disease 2019, just so that we're clear on what these terms mean. So today what we're hoping to uh, go over with you is a little bit about the biology of coronaviruses, uh, certainly in humans and how they've come to us, and then talk more about the pathogenic viruses, the ones that we're dealing with today, obviously SARS-CoV-2, but also a little bit on uh, CoV-1, a little bit about the natural history, the course, some management, where are we today? Um, we have a little bit on epidemiologic modeling and mitigation options, although there was a webinar a couple of days ago from the College of Public Health that really focused on that. So we're not going to be doing as much of that today. And then talk a bit about where, are, where we are with therapeutics. So this is the transmission of the, uh, of the virus itself. And you can see these little, these little outpocketings, which are the crowns, which is where the virus got its name. So just, for, just as we launch into what COVID-2 is all about, the good news is there are large family of viruses. Some cause illnesses in people and others cause illness in other types of animals. It, it, the viruses can infect animals and become able to infect people, but overall this is rare, which is a good thing. What's, what's actually a bit perplexing is we don't know the exact source of the current outbreak of COVID-19, and I'm gonna show you a bit about reservoirs that um, to, to give you the latest information on that. The good news is we don't have evidence that companion animals, our, our pets, our domestic pets can spread the virus. And we do not have evidence to suggest that imported animals or animal products pose a risk for spreading the virus. So I think that all is good news. So I'm showing a picture of bats here. These are reservoirs. Bats tend to be a reservoir for several of these kinds of viruses. And they, they're an ancient species dating back 52 million years with lots of biologic diversity. They um, have no bone marrow, interestingly, so they're very light, no B cells. They hibernate and they exist in massive colonies and they're highly mobile over their 10 to 30 year lifespan. And the reason I'm telling you this is if you look at the route of transmission of these viruses to humans, I think what you can appreciate if you look at the SARS-CoV as well as the MERS, this was the Middle Eastern version, of the coronavirus, as well as Ebola, you'll see that all three of those viruses really originated or were in bats as the putative host, moved to an intermediate host, and then of course the transmission mode really had to do with slaughtering and farming of wildlife as it is, is the case for COVID-2. What you'll notice is we don't really know the putative host right now. 
for COVID too. There's a lot of debate about this, but this is just to give you a sense of, of how these other viruses have evolved to us and where we are with that information. You know, as you know, we just recognized this virus really in December. And so we're still learning a tremendous amount. I would say this field is incredibly fluid. All right, let's talk a little bit about some other coronaviruses. Even though it says benign, they can cause some significant disease, although not quite in the order of magnitude that we're seeing with uh, COVID-2. But the coronavirus was first, first isolated in the 60s. They can present with mild or mortal disease, depending on the response on the host side, worldwide in distribution, and they can cause epidemics every two to three years. And they really are a pretty common cause of the cold, cause about 15 to 35% of colds. And they're generally mild disease, although they can uh, result in some asymptomatic shedding for prolonged periods, especially in infants in these cases. It's similar to the rhinovirus, which we know causes the common cold with an incubation period of about three days, with mild rhinorrhea or sinus congestion, um, with rhinovirus causing less coughing and, uh, and sore throat. <clears throat> the median duration of symptoms is about a week. And in healthy adult challenge studies, there actually are studies where adults were challenged with these viruses in a research setting, asymptomatic uh, shedding was common. You can see that there are complications. In infants, it can cause pneumonia and bronchiolitis, and otitis or ear infection in kids, exacerbation of asthma, we know that's the case. In healthy adults, we see pneumonia some of the time. Um, they can also exacerbate asthma in adults. In the elderly, we tend to see more serious consequences, which is gonna be something we'll talk about with COVID-2 as well. And absolutely in our immunocompromised patient population, we think about patients who have malignancies, have undergone lung transplant, or on medicines that can compromise the immune system, the complications can be much more severe. All right, so with that, I'm gonna move on to more of the pathogenic coronaviruses and first talk about the first the SARS outbreak, which was in 2002, also originated uh, in, uh, in China in November of 2002. It really came to the world's attention when cases were exported to Hong Kong in 2003, and there was rapid spread among healthcare workers um, visits uh, with secondary cases in residential settings. And this is a, a Time Magazine issue from May of 2003, you know, illustrating the uh, concern around that epidemic. Interesting, it has very different characteristics than what we're dealing with now. Uh, only about 8,000 cases with a mortality rate of 774 deaths confirmed. Uh, fatality rates were actually quite high, seven to 17%, especially in that elderly population and those with underlying conditions. And we're gonna talk about that when we get to the COVID-2 as well. That's really important to know. Interestingly, they had no mortality in children less than 12 years of age. And, and what we really know about the immune system as we age is it changes dramatically in terms of our ability to really mount a response you know, to the virus. And so um, that is this, the, the, the change in the immune system with aging is, is, is sort of a consistent theme among the coronaviruses. And really, just as we're doing now, which was done then, containment by epidemiologic intervention, isolation of patients, which we're doing now, careful attention to contact, droplet, and airborne precautions in healthcare settings, quarantine of exposed persons, limitations of travel. And the global transmission was contained very quickly, ended in 2003, and now we really only see cases when there are lab accidents or if there happen to be contact with civic cats, which we know is a, uh, a host that can transmit. So really this was a, a, a mini example, if you will, of what we're living now. And I think um, the efforts were very successful at containing uh, this, uh, this virus and not really turning it into the pandemic we're seeing now. All right, so let's move to uh, SARS-CoV-2. We can see it, we know that it originated in Wuhan, China, patient number one. And if you look at this slide, this is very um, uh, remarkable. You can see that the first case was reported December 27th, so really not very long ago. An alert was raised by the local health authority in China, and the Hunan seafood market was closed right at the end of December, so that happened very rapidly. You can see it wasn't until about January 7th that in fact the SARS-CoV-2 virus was identified. So we really haven't known about this virus for very long. And then the sequence was shared with the WHO in early January. And as we move through January, it was really around the 20th or so that COVID-19 
disease caused by SARS-CoV-2 was added to, no to notifiable diseases. And then of course, as we've all heard, Wuhan city shut down right around uh, toward the end of January, as, as along with 15 other cities. So if you look at this progression, it was incredibly rapid, which I think is something that's a, a little bit different than maybe what we've seen with other uh, uh, um, viral illnesses. And then of course we know it's become a pandemic. Certainly as we talk about its effects in China really during January, early February, and then because we live in such a global community with air travel, um, that it became a, a pandemic uh, relatively rapidly. And I think um, uh, uh, that's just something that we all have become very aware that we really are one global community. And because of that, the, when these outbreaks happen in one country, we are not immune as, as a world, as, a, as, a, as an entire um, globe. We are very susceptible. And that's, these are some of the lessons that we're absolutely learning um, and, and how to think about this for the future. Now, the common symptoms that were identified in China, um, and they're very similar to what we're seeing in the US maybe with, uh, and, and other countries with maybe some slight variation. Certainly fever is a prominent symptom. Generally 99.5, 100, um, a little bit above that, not extremely high fever. Dry cough is common. Fatigue are probably, oops, probably the three major symptoms. You know, what's interesting now is we're gaining more experience with this virus is in fact, we see loss of taste or smell as being common presenting features. Also rhinorrhea, sinus congestion, which we thought wasn't as common. Talking with uh, some of my colleagues in Italy about what their Italian experience has been, I think some folks have sort of counted sinus congestion as perhaps thinking they had a common cold like a rhinovirus or allergies. In fact, it's, it's likely that uh, sinus congestion may be a, a symptom due to COVID-19 as well. If we look at imaging, so the chest CT has turned out to be very valuable. Oftentimes the chest x-ray isn't as remarkable when patients are starting to develop, develop more symptoms. And so the CT has particular features I wanted to share with you. And really looking at this entity we call ground glass, which is what we see here in panel A. And that of course can progress to bilateral disease. You see here in these white areas, these are, these are cross-sectional uh, pictures of the lungs. And so the black is the lung itself. This is the heart here, and the aorta is here. And I think what you can appreciate, the lungs really should be primarily black with some white areas for blood vessels and airways. And so this ground glass is not supposed to be there. It's very abnormal. And then as the disease progresses, you can see more of that and what we call sort of consolidation as these areas of ground glass really begin to consolidate and look much more white as, as pneumonia is being developed, as uh, the lungs become more leaky, if you will, and develop bilateral pneumonia, as you can see in panel C. And, and, and eventually, uh, patients will develop uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome as a consequence. Sometimes we can see fluid around the lung, which are pleural effusions. That's, that's uh, also a, a feature. So the CT findings have actually really helped emergency medicine physicians, as well as other physicians, um, really decide, is this COVID-19 or not? So radiologists are becoming much more comfortable with that, using this modality. So the clinical prognosis and recovery can take a lot of different pathways. Obviously, there's going to be different ways patients present, from mild to critical. And that's really going to depend on the host response, the immune response really mounted by a, a given patient. Also, their comorbid conditions are going to influence that and, and potentially their genetics as well. And what's interesting, there's been some interesting data on actually having past coronavirus infection can actually enhance the response to this one, which seems a little counterintuitive, but there's this entity called antibody-dependent enhancement that in fact, we're just learning a little bit more about. And the question is that may explain some of the the heterogeneity and response that we're really seeing around the world. And so really what you can see is mild cases, very well, they can be asymptomatic or mild, and they can, patients can recover without any sequelae. You can appreciate how patients who present with more moderate symptoms and features can really go in a couple of different directions. And then as we move to severe and critical, obviously those are the patients we worry about the most, that require intensive care, develop acute lung injury, and are really at the risk of, of dying from the disease. And 
if we look at the age distribution, and this is some experience that has um, that uh, has been in, has happened in China, I wanted to share with you, but this is also really bearing out around the world. Is the age is really a critical factor here? As I mentioned, the immune system changes quite a bit with age. We have what's called immunosenescence, meaning that that the immune system cannot really mount the appropriate responses to viral infections. And and what you can appreciate is well the number of cases in patients who are are uh, 70 and above are less, you can appreciate that the fatality rate is significantly higher compared to the a number of cases in that group. And certainly globally, which is what this next slide shows, we see that again. The 80 plus year old group, the death rate has been about 15%. And as you look down this chart, as the ages decrease, you can see that the fatality rate decreases significantly. And really there have been no fatalities uh, in the zero to nine uh, year old age range. So speaking of that, what are some factors that are associated with worse prognosis? As we talked about, older age, and that's being defined now as 65, and as I get older, I, uh, I don't always like these age cutoffs, but you know, this is what it is. And, uh, and 65 is sort of the, the, the time when things sort of begin to change, at least that's what the experience has been, and we're gaining more experience with this every day. The presence of hypertension, very important, uh, chronic lung disease, COPD, of course, being a, an important one. There's been some controversy about asthma. Some of the epidemiologic studies out of China and Italy suggest that asthma and allergy are not important. However, the recent uh, publication of the Seattle experience in the New England Journal that came out uh, uh, last week suggests that, that asthma, even mild asthma treated with steroids, oral steroids for an exacerbation, three of the 24 patients were in that category which of course, as a practicing pulmonologist, I find that to be a very scary statistic. Um, diabetes is certainly also uh, very important to, to uh, that it's associated with worse prognosis, kidney failure, liver disease, and obesity is interesting in that sometimes the, uh, obesity can be associated with other comorbid conditions like diabetes, metabolic syndrome, hypertension, and oftentimes obesity is associated with high interleukin-6 levels, which uh, we know IL-6 is actually a very important cytokine that's generated early in the course of infection with COVID-19. And so whether there's a connection there is not entirely known, but it is an interesting association. And actually anti-IL-6 therapies are being looked at as treatment for the disease. And any immunocompromised state, as I mentioned before, people who have cancer, who have had organ transplant, who have HIV, or use of medications such as in the rheumatology world for lupus and for rheumatoid arthritis that may suppress their immune system. So all of those can increase uh, our risk and, and are associated with a worse prognosis. And of course, residents in a nursing home or long-term care facility also a very important group that we're aware of. We're seeing this certainly uh, in Tucson, but all over uh, the country that this particular situation really does uh, unfortunately lend itself to worse prognosis, just given the proximity of patients, but also most likely their comorbid conditions as well. Now, the other side of the coin is there are mild and, and subclinical and preclinical infections. And I think this is something that's gotten many of us very concerned. What is the, the rate of asymptomatic disease and how does that you know, affect uh, our ability to really fight this pandemic and, and really flatten, our, flatten the curve, if you will? And so the true frequency isn't really known. And I think until we start doing widespread antibody testing, we won't necessarily know. Um, we know that viral shedding can begin two days before clinical presentation, and patients may be infectious during that period. And viral shedding can last between 10 and 20 days, and it's a bit heterogeneous. And so as I mentioned, serologic studies will really be needed to define the full spectrum of disease. And when I get to, when we talk a little bit about some of the testing that's coming up, that'll be included because I think there's a lot of action going on in that space. So this slide really shows us what viral concentrations in the throat and sputum are. The, um, the uh, receptor or the, the enzyme that is used by COVID to, for cell entry is called angiotensin converting enzyme 2 or ACE2. And there's a high concentration of H2, ACE2 actually in the oral mucosa, also in the GI tract and, and, and a a, a medium amount of expression in the lung, but certainly the, the mouth and GI tract are big expressors of ACE2. And so what this, um, this shows is really the high concentrations of the virus before symptoms and how it can persist eight to nine days and even longer, even greater than two weeks in some cases. And patients are often positive by PCR 
which is the test we're using to identify the virus, the RNA, um, after symptoms resolve. And that's going to be very important when we think about folks who have been ill, when they can go back to work, and how do we handle that. We'll, we'll address that a little bit later. Now, this study got a lot of attention in the New England Journal as what do, uh, how long do SARS-CoV-1 and 2 last on surfaces? And I know this has been very important to all of us as we think about how to maintain our environments to really reduce our risk of, of contracting this uh, disease and this, this virus. And you can see that aerosols, of course, the virus is both the blue is CoV-1, the red is 2. Certainly, the virus lasts quite a long time in aerosols. And we know that anything that generates aerosols, the virus can, um, can appear, even speaking can generate aerosols. And that's where the six foot social distancing recommendation has come in. Just from speaking, however, just so you know, there's a little bit of aerosol generation that quickly dissipates. So six feet apart from your, from your uh, friends, neighbors, and, and, and uh, friends and neighbors will definitely protect you from that exposure. Now aerosols in the hospital setting are a little different, and we'll talk about that later. Interestingly, copper is a surface where the virus does not last long. Um, certainly cardboard, that caused a lot of interest around the mail and how does that work? And I think what we, we don't necessarily have a good feel for that other than I would say if you're getting mail and you open up your mail, then wash your hands right afterwards is what I would recommend. Um, I don't, some people have gone so far as to wipe down their packages. I know that's being done, but certainly at the very minimum, wash your hands and when you do so, wash them for 20 seconds with soap. And uh, sing happy birthday twice. That's a good way to remember that it's 20 seconds because that's longer than you think. Then of course, stainless steel. Many of our appliances are stainless steel. The virus can last a while there. And plastic. So these are just important issues to be aware of as we think about how we are going to modify our environments um, to really reduce our risk of, uh, of uh, contracting the virus. And so when we think about transmission from person to person, which is the way this is going, you know, the data are very fluid, I will say. Um, according to a WHO China report, the rate of secondary COVID-19 ranged from 1% to 5% um, among tens of thousands of close contacts. It doesn't seem very high. However, if you look at some of the cruise ship data, that will, that will, uh, that's, that's another uh, interesting uh, part of the data I'll share with you. I think really it depends on what we do with ourselves to really limit exposure to others. And so that's where the six feet social distancing comes in. There's been a lot of talk about wearing masks and whether we should do that. Um, I think uh, certainly in the United States at the level of the federal government, there's a lot of discussions about that. And, and really the reason to wear masks is not necessarily, it's yes, you can protect yourself, but it's really to avoid, avoid infecting others. And so there is no, at this point, national recommendation around that. Although you might see people wearing masks in other countries, they certainly do. And, uh, and so that's, a, that's an area of active conversation, certainly in the United States. And this yeah, is Dr. Kraft, that, yeah. that was actually one of the questions, so I'm glad we tackled it here, because the sure. specific question was really, um, what, what is, is there actual guidance with respect to using um, sort of fabric masking? And I think uh, I would articulate two things in addition to Dr. Kraft. Yes. When you talk about a population as a whole, generalized masking actually does a better job of stopping the person who's symptomatic, sneezing, or coughing. For the protection side, I think people need to be cautious when they use a mask because there are what I call impaired mask behaviors where somebody might take a mask and simply put it under their chin and then put it back, which in case the mask is externally contaminated, then they can actually sort of self-give them uh, a viral load. So I would say if people were gonna use sort of personal masking, you want to have really good hygiene around it, which means taking the mask off by the ears, hand hygiene for the 20 seconds, like Dr. Kraft said, and then only putting it back on. And you no know, frequent washing. And um, our infection prevention uh, uh, colleagues advise us that if you have a piece of clothing that you feel might be contaminated, like you're coming home from working as a healthcare worker, Hot, hot water and regular laundry soap is, will suffice. So just please, if people are gonna mask, make sure to not just dip it below your chin, but take it all the way off. Absolutely. Thank you. No, that's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. I think that that really helps because I think we're trying to figure out as a population, should we, I mean, many countries already 
wear masks in public. We know that happens in Asia very commonly. We don't tend to do that as much in the US and there's a lot of discussion about whether we should. And I think uh, we may be moving that direction even though we don't have a, a formal recommendation along those lines. All right, so who needs testing? I think that's also been an area of controversy and an area of fluidity. The uh, Center for Disease Control, which has provided a lot of uh, a very good start with regards to um, guidelines on how we take care of ourselves and others um, have also put guidelines out for testing. And so the recent update, which was March 24th, really talked about different priorities of people who should be tested. And that's what we've got here for you. And, and I wanna also say with the caveat, these guidelines should be interpreted at the local level, institutional level, as well, depending on what the particular population is that one serves. And so, so I just want to say, say it with that caveat. But basically, priority one, um, certainly we want to ensure optimal care for all our hospitalized patients. So I think that's very straightforward and self-explanatory. Symptomatic health care workers are also considered priority one. You know, what's interesting is they were not necessarily priority one until the updates occurred. So I actually, from a personal perspective, happy to see that. I mean, we need to preserve our, our health care workforce to take care of patients, otherwise we'll, I think, be in real trouble. Um, priority two are those patients we were talking about who are at highest risk of complications. And, those, and it's important these folks are rapidly identified. So folks in long-term care facilities, as we discussed, patients 65 years of age or older with symptoms, or who have underlying conditions and symptoms, and those people who are first responders, our paramedics, our firefighters, folks like that. So they are considered priority two. Priority three would be also considering critical infrastructure workers, those people that work in, you know, the gas company, electric, those types of things. Um, that it, it, it and this is as resources allow, test individuals in the surrounding community um, to decrease community spread and ensure the health of essential workers. And, and this priority three also allows for individuals who don't meet any of the above categories who have symptoms. I think the important take home message is right now we're really focusing on those people who have symptoms. We are not advocating testing for people who do not. And, and then individuals with mild symptoms in communities where they're experiencing high COVID-19 hospitalizations. So those would be considered in priority three. And then really those of low priority, as I said, are folks who do not have symptoms. So that's, and that really has to do with availability of tests at this point and how we can allocate our tests to really make sure we're identifying the illness in those patients who need attention right away. So the CDC, right. I think yeah, one, of, one of the areas of controversy, and uh, somebody uh, is, is asking this question right now, is people who are in, quote, congregated setting. Um, and I think what our recommendation has been is to ensure that we're having vigilant symptomatic surveillance, uh, more frequent temperature checks, so we can quickly cohort. We recognize there is asymptomatic shedding, which means in congregated settings like a skilled nursing facility, pre-assume that there's, there's the potential for infection in the facility, so begin the social distancing early, but then still do constant vigilance around uh, temperature monitoring in facilities. That's kind of the best recommendation we have right now. Absolutely, I think you're absolutely right. I think, and we're doing that in our outpatient clinics, for instance, with some screening to make sure that patients are coming in, especially the settings where there are lots of patients or lots of people that we, we screen for these acute symptoms because we certainly wouldn't want them associating with folks who don't have symptoms. And the CDC is a great resource uh, for folks who wanna see what the, the guidelines are. And I, as I said, I think they're a start. And then we have, we have taken those guidelines and really moved with them at our local institution to make sure that they fit for the kinds of patients that we care for. And so I'm just gonna go over a couple of, of uh, little tidbits of information that really are sort of take home messages for you. Um, if in fact you do, uh, become ill due to COVID-19, what can you do to reduce the spread? Now remember, if you get the virus, this does not mean that you're destined to have acute lung injury and really bad outcomes. There are many, many cases that are mild, patients do very well, they recover, they move on. However, what we wanna do is if you, if you do happen to uh, develop COVID-19, you wanna really be vigilant about making sure that you don't spread the virus. And so, so th these are some recommendations that are, are they're straightforward, but I wanna make sure we cover them. Certainly stay home except to get medical care, stay in touch with your physician, avoid public transportation in public areas. 
isolate yourself. For instance, if you're at home with other family members, create a room that only you are in. Don't share personal items. Limit contact with your pets because there is the chance that the pet can become ill. We don't want that. Um, call ahead before visiting your physician. We're doing a lot of screening along these lines as well to make sure that if patients do have symptoms that they are seen in the appropriate clinic and wear a face mask. I think uh, that's also very important. Cover your cough, uh, cover, cover your mouth when you cough and sneeze. Dispose the tissue in a lined garbage can. Wash your hands often and remember for those 20 seconds. And then avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. And then of course, clean all high touch surfaces every day, countertops, door handles, et cetera. And then- So one of, Dr. Dr. Kraft, one of the questions about uh, home care also has to do with uh, the most effective temperature monitoring. Right. So people have some sort of question, an uh, oral um, or temporal, uh, which, is, which is better, or are they reliable? I, I definitely think that you stick to one measurement mode, like alternating between two different measure types is probably complicated. I yeah. know there's been some concern about the, the temporal uh, because it's about distance. Uh, with oral, you know it's in the mouth and you keep the mouth closed until, if it's one of the electronic ones, until it beeps, it's sure it's at a, a final temperature. Uh, with, with temporal, I think you just really want to follow the manufacturer recommendations on distance from skin. Um, I know that it, when you're doing massive temperature checking, like uh, before somebody walks into a facility, uh, there's new theories around using um, infrared uh, signals to say this person has elevated temperature, and because that's not uh, that specific, then pulling those people aside for uh, a more in-depth temperature check. So I think there's some, you know, not perfect here, but stick with one measurement type, make sure you're using the right distance from skin. Absolutely. Great recommendation. I think that's the way to go. And, and really monitor your symptoms. So if you start to develop symptoms, difficulty breathing, any shortness of breath, persistent pain or, or pressure, chest tightness, new confusion or ability to arouse, that's, uh, that's very serious, or any bluish lips or face. This, this all suggests that the disease is progressing, that in fact you do need to, to uh, seek medical attention. This is not an inclusive list, but these are just some thoughts about, about symptoms that you should monitor and be aware of if, if things start to change for you. And that's when you get in touch with your physician and really get, uh, uh, get seen immediately. So other things, if um, other sort of common sense uh, recommendations, rest and stay hydrated, try to eat a good diet. If you can exercise, that's not always possible depending on how you feel. And if you do have fever, the recommendation is to not use ibuprofen. That would be the Motrin, Advil, that's what they're called here in the, uh, in the US. Um, there are some observations only. Um, there, this is not, uh, the mechanism is not completely elucidated, but the thought is that the non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs may actually encourage or enhance the viral entry. Um, and so, therefore, Tylenol, acetaminophen is the way to go for fevers and, and myalgias, joint pains, or, or muscle aches associated with the virus. So, important take home message there. Now, if you happen to be somebody who's caring for somebody who's sick, much of these same concepts really do, do uh, prevail. You really want to monitor for emergency signs and symptoms that we just talked about. Um, prevent the spread of germs. Keep the person in one room as much as possible. Don't share household items. Wash your hands with soap and water, especially if you've been interacting with this person. Really keep visitors to a minimum. Clean surfaces. As Dr. Lee mentioned, wash laundry thoroughly in hot water. Um, use of gloves is recommended, especially when, when dealing with soiled clothing. And just make sure that that person is doing well, that they're hydrated, that they're eating a, a balanced diet and using Tylenol if, uh, if they have a fever. So this one, is, this one is an area of controversy, is when to continue home isolation. And Dr. Lee, I'd love to get your thoughts on this one too. Uh, I think that it really will depend on whether you've had testing or not before one goes into quarantine and then how long should you stay there. And, and what we know about viral shedding appears to keep changing. So this recommendation, I believe, is going to be more on the uh, fluid side. But for now, what we say is if you haven't had a fever for 72 hours, that's important. The question will be how long the symptoms really need to have passed. It's somewhere between 7 and 14 days, really depending on what you do for a living. So as an example, for some of my uh, uh, physicians in my department who work with patients who are immunocompromised, clearly we're going to err on the side of staying home longer on the 14-day side. 
Um, depending on what else you do and, and the symptoms have passed, we could go a little bit shorter. Um, I do think that these are uh, areas that are still under active discussion in terms of that, those, those days. Now, if you've been tested, I think the situation may be a little bit easier in that, yes, you've had a positive test, you no longer have fever, and you have two negative tests in a row over a 24-hour period. That actually provides a bit more assurance that the virus is, is less likely to be shedding. Um, Dr. Lee, what are your thoughts on this? I know this is a big area. <laughs> this is a tough one because uh, we have to actually also manage a workforce and say, when is it safe to let them back in? So just to reemphasize, we're really vigilant about um, the day of symptom onset as the way to start the count. So really helping people really catalog when they really felt they started symptoms. Seven is the absolute minimum. Uh, 14, as Dr. Kraft was saying, for the people who might work with immune compromise. What we don't yet know, and I think this is where the science has to evolve, is when do we show a test of cure? This is really a complicated issue. Uh, there's been controversy about looking for a two negative tests as a way to say they're safe. Um, I think the absence of fever is a, another way to go, but I guess we're sort of stuck with this, not stuck in a bad way, but right now we are living with the CDC recommendations, which is that variability between 7 and 14 from symptom onset with the 72-hour hold. There's right. another interesting question, which is why is it important to uh, sort of stop uh, fever reducing agents uh, because we do know that in some patients, particularly at day five, there'll be a, like there'll be an interval improvement and then there'll be a sudden kind of crashing again. And so part of the reason to make sure that anyone thinking about coming back to work is stopping fever reducing agents is to make sure they don't basically spike a new fever. Um, and some people believe that second spike of symptoms is a negative prognostic sign. Um, one interesting question that's come up on the chat board has to do with, uh, does, since elevated temperature is part of our response to illness, should we blunt it with um, uh, fever-reducing agents? Is it, is in other words, is Tylenol bad because it's stopping our body's natural response to infection? Dr. Kraft is a lot smarter about this than I am. Um, you might want to comment on that. That's a good question. Well, usually fever is associated with certain mediators such as tumor necrosis factor TNF interleukin-1. And I think what we know in terms of the host response is it sometimes can be too exuberant, too robust. And I think especially IL-6, interleukin-6, as I mentioned earlier, is another important meteor produced early in infection that really precedes what we call the cytokine storm, which means the big outpouring of mediators that really in increase inflammation and, and go on to do organ damage, even independent of the virus. And so what we want to do is, is really keep that response a bit blunted so that it doesn't really lead into this exuberant cascade that can go down the path of, of serious illness. And so I think there's, there, it's sort of a, a fine line that we walk because we do want some of these mediators out there, absolutely, to work at containing the virus and, and moving towards recovery. But almost we want to make sure it's not too much of a good thing, if that makes sense. All right, so moving on to personal protection, uh, protection equipment, PPEs. This is a very big topic that is on all of our minds every day, and I know personally I can say that. And there's two that we think about the most, the N95 mask, which I know you've heard about, and then the powered air purifying respirator, the, uh, the PAPR. And I actually wanted to turn this over to Dr. Lee, because I know you've got some thoughts on this, and if you want to, to comment. Uh, great. Uh, so I think I'm, I'm going to start a little bit before the um, N95 and the PAPR you see. So one of the first things we like to think about is um, risk-based protection. So the first one is obviously the social distancing and the simple mask. The second question would be, I have to be near somebody, but I'm not necessarily doing something which is causing those viral particles to get into the air. We use the word aerosolizing. So I would say at a minimum for healthcare workers or somebody caring for somebody, the face shield is really important because even if you're using a procedural mask correctly, you want to prevent that contamination of the droplets, which are they're most prevalent in the first three feet around a patient. You want to prevent those droplets from getting on that mask and getting on any part of your face because 
your eyes, which that's part of the reason why the face shield really helps, um, are another way that virus can get into the body. So I would say, even before we're talking about these two, we want to make sure we're getting um, eye protection and a surgical mask always uh, with a gown and with gloves. Now, for people who do have to engage in aerosolizing procedures, then we definitely want to move to this N95 masking again, always, always, always protected by the face shield. Pepper we use when people's faces, either through uh, facial hair or the way their nose is configured or just the, basically the way their, their bones work, um, we can't get a good fit with an N95. And for anybody on this call who is a healthcare worker, they know about the importance of fit testing to make sure there's that tight seal. Because the N95 was originally designed for tuberculosis, which is definitely an airborne disease. And it's, uh, it's a very slippery little bugger and it can really get around the corners. And so that's why you need that very tight seal with N95. So I would say, think about what you're doing and the degree of protection you need. Um, we're in many, many organizations, unfortunately, we're now at the second tier of PPE conservation called tier two, where we're actively trying to conserve uh, N95s. And what that means is really um, giving to a colleague their mask and having them preserve it. There's, this is, we're definitely at the boundaries of science here. When N95s were first created, we were definitely designed for single use for a episode of care and then discard. But now we're talking about things like reuse, uh, recycling, re-sterilization. The one thing that's probably true about N95 uh, reuse is that water is not your friend. So um, keeping them dry is important. And I know uh, one of the early questions was about, should I mist my N95 with isopropyl alcohol? I'm not sure that's a, a, a very validated uh, technique. Um, what, what we, some organizations have done is basically given a colleague three masks, they use it one day, they dry it for two and then reuse it. Um, others are looking at um, ethylene oxide, which for anybody who's involved in the surgical world knows is a more old fashioned uh, way to sterilize. It's very good because it's, it's, it's very kind on delicate structures. Um, and part of the way that N95s work are these microfibers that create the blockage to the small particles. So um, I think the jury's out uh, in the best way, but we're looking at things like hydrogen peroxide, ethylene oxide, and then sort of intermittent drying in a, in a, in a well-ventilated paper bag uh, in between use. So that's kind of where we're at for uh, this distribution. Excellent. Oh, that was a great, uh, great discussion, Dr. Lee. Thanks so much. And I think some, some of what you discussed is captured in the slide, really looking at thinking about droplet precautions, which are going to be the gown, eye protection, surgical mask. And then, as you mentioned, those uh, uh, the situations where there are aerosol generating procedures and the examples are right there in the hospital setting, intubation, bronchoscopy, suctioning for patients who are intubated and who aren't. Uh, BiPAP, which is a modality we use certainly to treat um, sleep disorders, but also respiratory failure in the intensive care unit, and nebulized treatments, which we use in the setting of uh, asthma and COPD, not infrequently. So all of those are very aerosol generating. I would also add to this um, procedures that are being done, like in the GI lab as well, um, surgeries are considered to be aerosol generating as well. So there are other areas. OB is another one that area of the hospital, um, very important to think about aerosols there. So that's where the N95 really comes in for that purpose. So um, yeah, this is, again, another evolving field as we think of ways to re, you know, recycle our, our, our N95s in a w such a way that we can preserve their function and just make sure that we are well prepared with regards to having enough PPE as the uh, pandemic evolves. All right, so I'm going to move on a little bit to uh, our, next, uh, our next phase, which is going to be sort of clinical course management and, uh, and some epidemiologic approaches. Um, I thought this would be interesting for you to see these three countries with overlapping approaches. And so Singapore, Taiwan, and Hong Kong did some very similar things, but slightly different with regards to how they handled this pandemic. And um, so for instance, Singapore instituted travel restrictions, contact tracing, reduced meeting sizes, but schools remained open in health monitoring. And their total cases as of yesterday, 1,049. So on the low side, certainly compared to 
what we're seeing uh, uh, in the US. In Taiwan, they also screen travelers, travel restrictions, home quarantine, so much more stringent, institutional quarantine, fines if you didn't abide, and schools closed. They have 339 cases. So just shows you what these, these, uh, these approaches can do. Hong Kong is a really interesting situation. So they also screened, had travel restrictions, inbound screening, quarantine, contact tracing, social distancing, schools closed. They had a very low number of cases in late February. Now this is the part that gets concerning and we're gonna be learning from these countries as the restrictions became relaxed, they actually had a second wave of cases and they are now as of yesterday at 802. So I think these, what this slide suggests is these, these approaches can be very effective and are being used globally in many countries and we're instituting many of these in the United States. However, one of my concerns that I think we still need to learn about is what happens when those restrictions are relaxed a little bit. And I know that's happening in China right now as well. So we're gonna be learning from that. And, uh, and then I think that's gonna go into our decision-making about how to handle uh, what we're gonna do uh, when we get to that point where we can uh, relax restrictions. And I'm looking forward to that day. So speaking of that, uh, as a United States-centric uh, example, I'd like to give you a, show you this. These are two different uh, states, Kentucky and Tennessee, and really how they handled COVID-19. And what's, what's amazing about this uh, slide is really the decisions made by the two states were really about a week apart. So a week doesn't sound like a long time, but when you're talking about a pandemic like this, it absolutely is. And of course, you can argue that making these decisions in March was already very late, but that's another story. So if we look at what Kentucky did, so Kentucky are the blue bars, the dark blue and the light blue. And the dark blue bars are really those, those are the number of cases they've had, the light blue illustrate those that have been tested. So I think what you can appreciate as time goes on, they've tested a large number of people. The governor declared a state of emergency really back in early March, and then they, and also strongly encouraged social distancing, as well as closing businesses, and so really made a lot of the decisions in early March. Tennessee took a little bit longer to do that. The governor didn't declare a state of emergency until much later, closer to March 12th, 13th, which doesn't seem like a long time, but honestly, when you think about the spread of this virus, it made a very big difference, as you can appreciate, in the numbers of cases, as well as the numbers tested. So I think what this slide illustrates to me is that these community efforts are uh, incredibly important and, and make a huge impact on what we're able to do to really flatten our own community curves, state curves, and of course that's going to affect our country as a whole. And so I thought this was quite an illustrative case. So what's happening now as of last night when I was uh, updating this talk so I could have the latest and greatest information for you? Unfortunately, we are above a million cases now globally with about 53,000 confirmed deaths. Now remember, not all uh, countries are testing ubiquitously, so there may be more than that, but these are the confirmed cases. And I think I just listed a couple of the key countries that we've been thinking about. China, you can see their numbers um, have come down. Uh, certainly their rate their rate of increase has, 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 has changed dramatically. I've updated these numbers a couple of times and I've been impressed by really, really very little happening in China. They're staying very close to this number with only small changes um, as compared to say Italy, Spain, Germany, Iran, um, um, still on, on uh, 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 trajectories. And the United States, of course, being the country with the, the most cases globally and New York being the most affected. And just as, as I think about this, I wanna just, give a shout out to this uh, website. Probably many of you might know about this already, but the Johns Hopkins uh, um, you know, Coronavirus uh, um, Resource Center is incredibly valuable because not only can you see if you're interested in the number of global cases, but you can drill down to different countries and you can even drill down to particular states and cities and see what the, the cases are. So it's a really um, valuable resource if you're interested in following this information. I think many of us are, and this would be one of the, the sites I would visit. All right, so um, I wanted to move on to some therapy. What can we do once we are faced with patients who've developed COVID-19? Where are we? And so just a couple words on testing. We talked about the test that and who gets it, and this is really the detection of viral RNA, which is done by a technique called reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, RT-PCR. It's a technique that's been around for a very long time. It's a very sensitive way of identifying the RNA of the virus. 
and a, a very common uh, technique. So that's around. The testing time is usually four to six hours. What we're finding is really happening in real life, depending just on the sheer number of tests performed, is the analysis can take a little longer than this, depending on the individual lab and its volume. And so I think that's an important piece if we think about testing turnaround time in our community. There are also immunoassays that can detect antibodies of the patient against SARS-CoV-2. That's going to really demonstrate past exposure, can be done very quickly, gives us great information about prevalence. There is a little bit about uh, with regards to false negative rate right, because it depends on when the, the, the antibodies were measured. It takes a certain period of time to go from an IgM antibody, which is what is first uh, generated to the IgG antibody, which is the, the uh, that demonstrates uh, uh, exposure. And so that time course is important and can be quite variable um, depending on the individual patient. So when that test is measured is important. So those tests Dr. are- Crown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a question about actually, now that you've raised the question of yeah. antibodies, uh, one of the questions was really, to use an old fashioned term, uh, the clinical utility or therapeutic utility of convalescent antibodies. In other words, uh, in people exposed, if we have a large pool of uh, asymptomatic healed infection in young people, for example, is there any utility in literally getting that serum antibody um, as a therapeutic intervention? It's a very old-fashioned way to yeah. do things. Yeah, there, there had been some talk about that. It's inter there are actually, of the, of the clinical trials out there, there are some that are actually looking at giving antibodies. I think the, um, the question is that it's hard to, you have to actually infect a lot of animals to be able to get enough antibody isolated to give as a therapeutic. So that part has been a bit of the rate-limiting step in terms of our ability to use that as a therapeutic. Um, then there's also other testing in terms of the future state. There's different parts of the viruses. The, the S protein, which is actually needed for viral cell entry, the N antigen, and so you can actually do immunoassays for detection of the viral antigen. So that's going to be a little different than detecting the viral RNA. And so that holds promise because that can be very rapid. It's, it's, it's very similar to a rapid flu test that we use. So those are under development right now, and I think that field is moving very fast. What I get excited about is some of this home testing, because I think if we want to keep patients who have symptoms who are you know, well enough to be home at home quarantined, and yes, we want to know if in fact they have the, the illness, because they could have other viral infections, right? That in fact, home testing, I think, is a, is a very interesting thought. It's been talked a lot about in the UK, for instance. And in the US, we have uh, Mammoth Biosciences, and I believe Sherlock may be an international company. They're performing these validation studies on these home testing using PCR, as, re as well as CRISPR-Cas editing, which really looks at specific aspects of the uh, viral genome as a point of care test. And you may have heard that Abbott Labs just introduced a point of care test as well using swabs to detect viral genome, very rapid turnaround, need to use their equipment in order to detect the, uh, the genome. They also do rapid testing for flu and other viral panels. So this is one more they're gonna add on to that. And so the question is, is how many labs, clinics, offices ultimately will have this equipment in order to do rapid turnaround measurement? So I think this is also a very interesting because that can be, you can imagine this could be in an office setting as well as a clinic, uh, as well as a laboratory. And so I think this field is moving very rapidly. There's a great reference that I put on um, um, the uh, Nature Biotech, I think I've got a nature, nature.com uh, reference at the end of the slide, which really has a great discussion about that if you're interested. So therapeutic research, um, you know, I, I was working on this talk the last few days. And so when I first looked at clinicaltrials.gov, which is where all the clinical trials are registered, um, they, um, there were 131 trials last Saturday. So today's Friday, so we're looking for six days ago. Last night, there were 282 trials. So you can see this field is evolving incredibly rapidly. I have to say, as somebody who does clinical trials, I don't think I've ever seen that growth of trials in an area so fast. And it just really brings, brings to the um, forefront what a global effort we have exerted really to really try to come up with therapies that we can provide for our patients. And I have to say, I'm really, um, I'm astounded, I'm, I'm humbled by the, the efforts that I'm seeing you know, in this arena. And the, the 
agents that are being tested really cover the whole gamut. And you can go into clinicaltrials.gov and you can take a look. There's actually a nice link for COVID-19 research and you can see what trials are actually underway. And they cover the spectrum of there's some vaccines that are under development, although that's going to take a little longer, as we know, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, there's antivirals, such as uh, from Denisphere, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine's gotten a lot of attention, HIV protease inhibitors, monoclonals, immune globulin. This is what you had mentioned, Dr. Lee, also um, under study. Um, there's also some other approaches. Corticosteroids are interesting to me done mostly in the uh, arena of when patients already have developed acute lung injury, is there a role for corticosteroids? You know, that's been something we've debated about for years in the ARDS world. And corticosteroids generally haven't been the way to go, um, but we'll, we'll have to see if in fact in, in this particular case, if they're beneficial. As I mentioned earlier, anti-IL-6 treatments, um, they are available in the rheumatology space right now and being repurposed actually for, uh, for, for COVID-19, because as I mentioned, IL-6 is a very prominent cytokine that is generated very early on in infection and really precedes the cytokine storm, if you will. And so the, the thinking is if you can modulate IL-6 and keep that at a low roar, you can really have potential to reduce the over-exuberant inflammatory response that you can see that really leads to end organ damage. JAK inhibitors and JAK, JAK stat inhibitors are intermediates and signaling pathways of many cytokines. And so that's why if you can intervene in some of these, these important intermediates, you can also reduce this, this cytokine storm. And then there are also lots of other studies out there. You name it, it's being studied, it almost feels like. There's herbal preparations, nutritional supplements. There's also registries being developed, symptom trackers and technology to track applications. Um, you know, saying, as I think about this, I think about how this COVID-19 pandemic can really change the way we, we do clinical trials. Um, I'm involved in one myself. I can give you um, a personal example where we're using an app where we can convey, we can get information from patients about their symptoms and how, in fact, uh, an infection is impacting their, um, their lives and if they happen to have chronic disease. And then, in fact, we can send them testing kits. They can mail them off. We can get RNA, DNA through saliva. And in fact, so we can do all of this with no touch, remote, remotely. And so I think this pandemic, if there's any good to be had, it has really opened up our minds to how we can really study the impact of this virus on our patients, and how we can do it in a lot of innovative ways. Just some vaccine complications. Um, I'm just listing here. The vaccine, of course, would be fabulous if we could get it. There are some challenges. I think the, the performance in the aging population certainly can reduce performance because the idea with vaccines is the idea is, is with a, a vaccine, we, one can generate um, antibodies in some cases. And um, there's a heterogeneous group of SARS-CoV that may vary as much as 35% compared to the SARS-CoV-1. There's also... Um, interesting challenges uh, with the vaccine because of this enhancing antibody phenomenon that I mentioned earlier, that infection with other coronaviruses can actually, they cause the, the production of antibodies that can actually uh, impair the, uh, the host response to the, to the SARS-CoV-2. And that, that is controversial right now, but that is certainly under a lot of study and that impacts the ability of a vaccine to be effective. And so, so right now, I think there's a lot of attention being paid to vaccines, but as you've probably heard, if you've been listening to you know, press conferences and such, we're, we are a ways away from really seeing that um, come to fruition, which I think is why we're seeing you know, 282 trials in clinicaltrials.gov, we're really looking at alternative approaches. Um, this is a slide. Doctor, oh yeah, go ahead. Dr. Pat, yeah. I have a question about vaccines and vaccine trials. Yeah. So obviously there's a lot of press around literally the first subjects are enrolled. Roughly, if you had to guess, uh, how long until we would know the efficacy of that first trial? That's different for then getting into production mode and mass distribution and like basically a, a mass vaccination program. That's what often takes the longest time. Right. But just to know whether it's effective or not. You know, um, at this point, I think it, it's, oh, oh, oops, I can show you this. Uh, can, it, it's quite variable. I'm thinking that you know, at least six months to a year to really get a sense for that, but hopefully less is what I'm hearing from my um, infectious disease colleagues. I mean, there's a real push 
to do this. We'll get some early preliminary data. I think what the question is, is who the vaccine is most geared for, right? And there's some concern about using it in our older population, and that's the population that, of course, probably needs it the most. So I think there is, um, uh, a, a, I feel like at least when I look into the literature, talk to my infectious disease colleagues, I get the sense that we are still a ways off. And, and really, in terms of getting it into the hands of patients, you know, at least a year is what I'm hearing these days. But I'm hoping as these studies start, I can come back and hopefully say it'll be less time. But that's what I'm hearing as of today. And are, are the vaccines against uh, the COVID-2 specifically or against uh, like basically SARS V1 and V2? My understanding is it's mainly COVID-2 specific is really what the idea is. But of course, you learn a lot from looking at responses to other coronaviruses as well. Um, but that's, uh, that's at least that when I look at the trials that are going on, they're really focused on, on the COVID-2. But I think that there's going to be some overlap. Um, for sure, and, and so, but I think that's the focus. Um, so looking at antivirals, and that's got, those are actually in treatment right now that seems something that may come on the horizon a bit sooner. Because as you can see from the data, especially this graph here uh, on, the, on the left, I think you can appreciate, this is the, the, um, the titer of the virus, and this is increasing concentrations of the antiviral, and you can see a very a nice decrease, which is good. And these are different forms um, of the virus, the pre-pandemic SARS and MERS. And so they're like the bat CoV. And this is the contemporary human CoV. So there may be benefits um, in, in really a, across a diversity of coronaviruses. So per your question, the antivirals may be a little bit more um, effective that way. And so I think these data look particularly promising. And I can tell you on clinicaltrials.gov, there are a number of studies. And I just want to give you an example of some of the bigger ones going on. There were a couple that started in China, as you can see here. And then these are the global studies below looking at all hospitalized patients, patients with severe disease, and patients with moderate disease. And so those are all underway right now. Um, and so I'm happy to, to see some movement there. So I think we're gonna have some results for these. I think um, very soon, if you look at the, the ends, so we need 400 for the severe, 600 for the moderate, 394 for all hospitalized. So those sample sizes are not huge, you know, compared to the number of patients we're seeing who are now developing the disease. Oops. All right. All right. I think one of the questions as you go into additional therapeutic agents, there's obviously been a lot of uh, lay press around the use of older anti-malarials. Yes. I think people might be confused is, does that mean that there's a, to use a fancy word, an arthropod vector or insect vector? I don't think there's any belief at the current time that this is um, a mosquito-borne or tick-borne disease. No. Um, uh, but there's a lot of interest now because they're looking at the chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine group of medications that's probably more about the way it's managing the immune system rather than it's an actual antiviral. I wonder, as you're yeah. commenting on uh, this combination of antiviral and immune modulating, how do these agents fit in? Right. Well, they act differently, right? Because the antiviral is really going to focus on, you know, the the because uh, you focus on the antibody response to the virus, uh, go along that that path, whereas the immunomodulators are really going to affect our our uh, innate and adaptive responses because there's the virus itself, and I think about that's what the the, the vaccine really focuses on. Then the immunomodulators are really uh, really assisting us with what is our host response to that virus because I think it's a yin and yang that both factors are critical in determining what the ultimate outcome is and so what this slide really shows is trying to get at it from both arenas and you can see this is just looking at different groups which have combinations of antiviral plus minus and immunomodulator which would be like an hydroxychloroquine for instance and so I think that ultimately or an anti and, and so or vaccine ultimately with an antiviral, um, which would be, you know, two ways of combating the virus plus an immunomodulator. So there may be combinations of medications at the end of the road that really we're going to end up using. And so one of the challenges is where we are now. You have to study each of these sort of individually, then in combination. And we're trying to do this very fast because we have patients who have very severe disease right now that need therapy. And so, um, so that's why there's a lot of activity, but we still have to wait the requisite period of time to see some results. But um, hopefully it will be months uh, for some of these trials and not years. Did that answer your question, John? Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Yeah.
All right. So basically, you know, as as I mentioned, I'm I'm you know again uh, amazed, um, uh, thrilled that this is that the global effort that's being put into this is is uh, really incredible. I'm not happy that we are in this situation by any means, but I must say I feel like I see it not only in my community, my and and country, but also globally how we really are working together to sort out how to take the best care of our patients, what therapies we can offer them, how to um, take care of those of us who maybe don't have a severe disease, how can we get past this, and really reduce the, the fear and anxiety that's associated with this pandemic. And so um, I feel like we're all, we're all in this together. I think science matters, absolutely. And, uh, and certainly there's so much active research going on, even at the at the University of Arizona, I can say that many of us are very engaged right now in changing some of our own research programs to focus on COVID-19 and the impact of this virus, this disease, on certain, certain comorbid conditions, looking at the pathobiology of the disease. There are a number of investigators at our own institution. And then, and that again also illustrates we've not, I'm, I'm, for instance, I'm working with people I haven't worked with before simply because we are coming together for this, for this major push to try to understand this virus and this disease better. And so, so then I would also say preparation matters. Um, we're doing a lot, certainly locally, and we, we can talk a little bit more about that um, in terms of what does it take to really flatten the curve. And I think, I think that can't be overemphasized how important it is that every one of us who, who uh, you know, live in this world, there are things that all of us can do to reduce the burden of, uh, of this uh, disease. Certainly competence matters. We gotta have good resources for information. We need good organization and, uh, and good communication. And certainly transparency and honesty go along with that. So with that, I wanna thank you for um, your attention and I'd be happy to take any additional questions. All right, one, uh, one small ask uh, for folks who put their, uh, there's a little glitch right now in the Q&A part where I can't actually see the question. So if you don't mind uh, just sending it to the chat box, uh, having no problem there. Uh, so let me catch up on a couple of questions. Uh, one of them is, it has to do with healthcare uh, workers and their degree of um, immunity relative to treating patients. I think the reason why this is a pandemic is because obviously we have no herd immunity at present, right? It's a, this is not all that different than when people arrived in the 1600s to central parts of America, and there was no native immunity to other diseases that were carried over. And so that's why it can be so devastating. Obviously, because of Dr. Kraft's point about a number of um, asymptomatic infections, obviously in the background, uh, immunity and herd immunity is developing. Uh, which is why even in influenza, even though it's a seasonal disease, there are some people who are in fact immune to it with the next seasonal cycle. So I think we don't really know until we have qualified um, healed uh, antibody, which is I think the IgG uh, test that Dr. Kraft's alluding to, we're not gonna know what the herd immunity is. I mean, Dr. Kraft, you may wanna comment about how we know how immune a relative population is, but it, it does, speak to the need for truly completed infection antibody tests to be sure. Absolutely, and I think when we think about our healthcare workers who are really the most exposed group, right? And so, so I think it takes uh, a lot of vigilant um, screening for symptoms that all of our healthcare workers know. And I, and I can tell you locally, we've put out communications many times. If there's any symptoms at all, make yourself recognized. Let's, let's go through the screening process for you. If, if, there any, if there's anything suggestive of COVID-19, move to quarantine, get tested, understand if you've got the uh, disease or not. And then, so that's what we're doing in, this, in the short term. And then of course the quarantine follows after and then the, the plans for return to work really depend on what those tests have shown. Because again, we, we, we also worry a little bit about other viruses, although I would say now we used to test, have to automatically test for influenza. We don't have to do that anymore. We're going straight to COVID-19 since that seems to be obviously the most common issue that we're, we're worried about. We're not as concerned about other viral illnesses. We're just worried about whether you have it or not. Um, and so whether we, and, and actually there's been some very interesting discussions about how to get a sense of this herd immunity. 
And so this is through some of the clinical trials that have, uh, are being designed. Um, we uh, would love to, there's, and there's ways to do even blood spot analyses where a patient just takes a few drops of blood, puts it on in a specific container, a well, or on a piece of paper. We can actually measure antibody response that way. They can actually ship it back to us. So there's ways of trying to get more of this done in the community to get a sense of this herd immunity. You know what we're not doing at this point, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, uh, uh, Josh, is really testing for antibodies in our healthcare workers sort of after and where we are with that. Um, and because I don't think a lot is known about the immunity to it and how long term it is. Um, I've heard very right. on this. And so that's another area that I think needs to be addressed that we, we're so busy just trying to diagnose the infection right now that we're not focusing as much on the prevalence of immunity and how long that immunity lasts and if it's effective. And I think those are going to be really important questions, especially for our healthcare workers. Right. I, I definitely think that we are going to, I can certainly speak on behalf of our workforce, they'd be the first ones to be part of answering that question. Yes. Um, and partly because if we believe that the presence of, of IgG antibodies indicates healed infection and therefore immunity, it also lets somebody come back into the workforce even if they were to have symptoms. Like, we know it's not COVID because, right. but what I don't think we've seen is whether people have a true second, second infection once they're showing uh, the IgG antibodies. Um, right. And a couple other questions are coming through right now. Uh, you, you raised the tantalizing thing of uh, ACE2, and really the question is, um, are there other things? One of the questions is about vitamins A, C, and D, that they might increase ACE2. Uh, it, I don't believe we've given any guidance about people who are on ACE inhibitors. Right, and so we do need to talk about that. So there was recently a statement put forth by the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association on this issue. So what's fascinating about the ACEs, so ACE2, of course, is this is, is a critical uh, you know, receptor for the virus that, that facilitates cell entry. It also needs to be, uh, there's also uh, other, other entities as well, but ACE2 has gotten a lot of attention. And so we know that ACE inhibitors and uh, angiotensin receptor blockers can actually increase ACE receptors. And so, but yet, as you recall, patients who are receiving these medicines, those receptors are being inhibited, right? So that's important to know. So the number may go up if they're being inhibited. What we know from the SARS epidemic, the CoV-1, is that being on an ACE or an ARB, so an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker, is that it actually protected against lung injury. So in fact, there's a trial going on right now to look at Losartan, which is an ARB, um, and, and if it confers protection in the setting of COVID-19. So it may be a little counterintuitive in that these, these medications Yes, they may increase the receptor, but in fact, um, because of their inhibitory functions, may actually be protective. And so the recommendation right now is if for, for folks who take these medicines, of which there are a lot, to not make any changes at this point, because I think there's, there's enough controversy around this and we need to get the results of that trial before we can make recommendations. And especially since hypertension in and of itself is a risk factor, you know, you certainly wouldn't want to stop your ACE if that's why you're being treated. Right. Uh, uh, one, one little additional plea as a, as a general internist is that I recognize as we've shut down almost all other uh, elective aspects of healthcare, uh, for anybody who's hearing this or has any friends, remember if you're missing a specific screening interval, because during this time period, we're not doing a bunch of regular healthcare that keeps people safe and well. And so it's a plea to the general public Keep track of your mammogram, your pap smear, your colonoscopy, because we need to catch up when all this is over. That's a little public service announcement. Yes, thank um, you. But, 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 the, but the second part is really, um, there's a lot of interest on our uh, uh, um, attendees about if they, if they know that somebody was testing positive and now recovered and they want to get into a clinical trial, as we're trying to understand immunity, is clinicaltrials.gov the best way to find clinical trials in your area that may be addressing this? Uh, yes, I would say that's true. I think the local university, if you live in um, a city that has one, an academic medical center would also be a source because oftentimes they are sites for trials or they will at least have connections to other, other um, institutions that are doing them. For instance, um, we're doing an acute care 
Uh, we're doing several acute treatments for COVID. We're doing trials right now in our hospital that are being managed by you know, other institutions as the main site, and we are a local site, for instance. And then we're instituting some of our own as the main site. So I would say a combination of the um, Academic Medical Center near where you live, if you live near one, um, versus clinicaltrials.gov would be another. There are, there's contact information there. So good, good question. One, one of the um, things that's also come up is, uh, again, the vitamins with relationship to ACE2. I have not seen any trials about uh, whether vitamins are affecting ACE2 levels. Uh, have you? I think there are some in the works, but they're not, we don't know the data. Um, so, so can't say much about that um, at this point. Um, we know that ACE2 right. like, is expressed very highly in the oral mucosa, the GI tract, the lung. Um, however, um, we, what we're trying to understand is what that expression actually means with regards to susceptibility to infection. Because there's, there's, I think there's more to the story than just, than just the um, expression alone. I think we have one of the other colleagues are asking us about um, how, how is this different from other uh, viral pandemics or viral infections. I think the one thing to remember is for a lot of other viral families, there are effective treatments, right? For the herpes viruses, there's a group of medications. Uh, even in influenza, I don't know that it necessarily changes uh, mortality rates, but we can treat symptoms uh, with like also Tamivir. So, I think what's really novel here is the absence of a known effective um, antiviral, uh, which is why Dr. Kraft uh, ran us through Redemsevir. So I think that's why this is different, absence of herd immunity, um, really Greenfield, and then the absence of effective antivirals. Absolutely, I mean, we just recognized this virus in December. So it's, been, it's, it's not been with us in, in, a, in the way that we know it um, for very long. And yes, you're right, we had no immunity. Many of us were not, um, I think most people who live through the Spanish flu are probably not with us anymore. So most of us living right now really haven't lived through a, a pandemic like this. And remember for the flu, we do have a vaccine that is at least partially effective. So we've got options in addition to um, Tamiflu that we can take for symptoms. So we have options for, for several viruses. And, and really the feeling about the coronaviruses prior to the first SARS epidemic is that they're they're not they're just they live in our in our communities they don't cause a lot of of bad disease for the most part um, i think SARS one gave us an idea cov one gave us an idea that maybe there is this group of pathogenic viruses and so obviously we're seeing that now um, what i actually think about is um and and is, is what are we doing to sort of screen for future viruses in reservoirs and in, in animal reservoirs and what are some of the practices happening globally that have enhanced transmission from animal to man um, and if you remember that slide looking at how we uh, you know uh, prepare food um, slaughter wildlife etc all of those techniques I think really need to be revisited because I'm actually thinking even heaven forbid I, I'd like to come to a situation where we can really understand what's out there and then, and then be proactive as opposed to having to be reactive like we are in this pandemic. So another, a little public service announcement on that. Um, if, if nothing else happens from, from this pandemic, then people have sort of fallen in love again with hand hygiene, uh, which is the single most uh, effective way to reduce um, infections associated with healthcare. That would be a good thing. So uh, mm -hmm. hand washing has always been really effective. And I think I'm hoping that you know that won't be lost from our continuous memory. Um, and I, the other, I just want to validate my answer to, to one of the colleagues, which was, um, I do not believe either the IgG or nor IgM uh, at ELISA assays are available now. Uh, they're not right. Is that correct, Dr. Kraft. They're available in well, according to the most recent Nature Biotech uh, review that I had referred to, they are available in China and Europe and not necessarily here yet, but they will be getting here. And I know there's, there's actually investigators even at our own institution working on this. Yeah, so, so, so sorry for the answer I gave, which is I didn't think they were available in the US, which is true, but they are available overseas. Mm -hmm. Right, Right, and I think they're coming uh, up, so I think for research purposes, we actually can, um, we can do it. So we actually have available, right. they're just not necessarily a clinical test yet. Just a, a quick primer on the immunology, the, the IgM will happen uh, usually first, 
uh, and will go away quickly. It's the IgG that stays longer. So I don't know that it's more sensitive. It just has to do with uh, the time course relative to the infection. Exactly. And when the, when the assay is done. Exactly right. All right. Other questions? Uh, again, yeah, if, you, if you've asked a question in the Q&A, please put it in chat just so we can make sure we didn't miss it. Um, oh, you know, I do want to mention one thing as we're thinking of any questions left. We're, we're doing a lot of focus on virtual uh, visits in the ambulatory setting because one of the concerns that has happened with this pandemic is we don't want to stop our entire outpatient practices because we see a lot of patients who have chronic illnesses that need to get seen. We can't just cancel appointments across the board. And so all across the country, really globally, telehealth has taken on this new life. And so I can say personally, and I know Dr. Lee and I have worked on this together, we're, we're, we have a virtual platform and, and in fact converting all of our outpatient clinics really to virtual as much as possible. I, I don't, we can't completely um, eliminate the face-to-face -face, because there are situations where patients absolutely need to be seen and we wouldn't, we would not deny that in any way, but a lot of them can be virtual and having the video um, piece to it actually is just, it takes a little getting used to, but I think it's actually a, um, an interesting uh, aspect to what we do and that way we can keep connected to our patients because I, as a practicing pulmonologist that sees patients with very severe lung disease, I feel like that's really important. I can't let my patients go months and months without their appointments. And so um, I personally have some virtual clinics coming up. And so I'm very, very uh, grateful that that opportunity exists. Um, there's always the phone as well, but I think the virtual video piece really adds a lot to the interaction and my ability really to take care of these patients. So I wanted just to mention that, that I think that's taken on a new life. And that's gonna potentially change the way we practice medicine because we're even looking at telehealth options on the inpatient service for consultants, that, uh, for patients that need help. Um, so Josh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Well, as someone who used to uh, focus on health IT a lot, I would say the degree of transformation the past 22 days is, is, is more than we've seen in the past 50 months. Uh, the acceleration and the fundamental relaxation of many uh, federal requirements around telemedicine, such as where you have to be, how you have to be licensed, um, the ability to get reimbursed as if you're in the office, even though it's a telepresence visit, um, all that has literally changed overnight, um, which I think is a good thing long term uh, for better access for our patients. So we'll see um, we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm hoping I know Dr. Kraft has a full panel next week. Uh, she will definitely tell me how it goes. Um, <laughs> I certainly some, will. A <laughs> couple other questions that have come up. Uh, I think that it's a little bit of a recap uh, from the beginning of the lecture where you talked about um, antibody dependent enhancement. In other words, if someone had had prior SARS exposure, would we expect them to have a worse outcome with SARS-CoV-2? Yes, now that is it's controversial because um, there's, you know, there, there, we're, we're at a bit of a loss to explain some of the geographic diversity in presentation. And so there's a, maybe a lot of reasons for that, depending on sort of the types of, of you know, sort of our genetics obviously are, are going to vary a little bit from country to country. Um, comorbid conditions, probably not so much. There's plenty of all of those that I listed around the world. And so the question is, is there, is, are there some differences in, in, in our immune response? And so this antibody dependent enhancement has gotten a little bit of traction. And again, it's still controversial. So I don't think we have all the answers. So the idea is if in, in communities where these benign coronaviruses that I talked about earlier on, and even the, the SARS-CoV-1, if, if there's been infections with past coronaviruses, does that impact the ability of, of the host to respond to SARS-CoV-2? And there are some data to suggest that might be the case. I think this is a very fluid area. So I hesitate to draw any firm conclusions about it, but it does add some challenges to certainly the efficacy of vaccines. And, and then what, that, what, what is the precise mechanism of this antibody-dependent enhancement and how does that impact vaccine development, for instance? Um, and so that's why I think um, is where we are with that. I think it's, a, a, it, it's, an, it's an interesting, uh, concerning issue that could maybe explain some of our geographic diversity in response to the uh, infection, um, but that's, there's still more data yet to come. So uh, one little last PSA, I promise. Uh, 
I've seen a, I think, message to everybody that this is, the recording will be um, uh, put up there uh, for everyone to watch after in case they missed a part of it. Um, the second question is, is people are asking about pulse oximeters at home. Um, definitely in people who don't usually use oxygen. Um, there's, there is some belief that uh, if you come in and you're symptomatic but you're not sick at that moment, doing home monitoring uh, for pulse up, for a, a drop in uh, your pulse ox saturation would be an indication that you're getting sicker. So a good example is somebody who's normally healthy, um, for them to have uh, a saturation of 93%, 94%, pretty unusual actually. Right. Not for people with chronic lung disease, but for a normal healthy host, uh, that would be problematic and an indication to go back to get help. Again, with that concern that people worsen around day five. Uh, I, one last question I want to pose to uh, Dr. Kraft has to do with azithromycin, um, and then we'll, we're actually run out of time. Uh, we know that this has been in combination with chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine. Any ideas why azithromycin might be helpful? Yeah, azithro is a really interesting uh, antibody. It's a macrolide that has um, static, not cidal effects on bacteria. So it's not necessarily uh, bactericidal. It also has a lot of anti-inflammatory effects as well. And so it's gotten a lot of play in, in various chronic illnesses, such as um, certainly cystic fibrosis, COPD, non-cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, asthma. So a lot of lung diseases have really taken taken uh, to this and there's been some very nice data suggesting efficacy in these chronic illnesses and so that has really focused more along the lines of its anti-inflammatory effects more likely but we also have a hint that there's some microbiome changes that may also happen as well that actually may be in, to the benefit of the host um, but the mechanism honestly is not entirely clear and so um, that's generally with azithro we and also another aspect which may be relevant is it has promotility effects and so if you think about where you know ace2 is expressed where the virus may be a promotility agent may be beneficial in this setting so that may be another beneficial way that azithromycin can help but i think we're not entirely sure of how it works but those are the the, um, the functions of the uh, macrolide as we know it today. And I'll maybe cap with this one and just, of course, thank everybody is that um, when, you're, when you're faced with this great unknown as we were many years ago with, um, with HIV, I think there's a zeal to try to find agents. And so we just want to make sure it's time for good science. I completely agree. And, um, and so I was, you know, as I said, I was astounded about the number of trials on clinicaltrials.gov. I can't speak to how, how, how well designed they all are and, um, and, and et cetera. Um, although the ones that we talked about today, I think are well designed. So I'm happy to see that. But I do agree. I think we have a higher bar now with clinical trials in terms of what we expect to see how we power them, how we look for effect size outcomes. And so that brings me some, um, some hope that I guess when we, we do see results of these trials, we can believe that they're true. We have a much more well validated regimented approach trials. Um, so agree with that. And, and, and I wanted to also add, I completely agree with you on your statement about a pulse oximeter. Um, obviously I'm a pulmonologist, so I told lots of my, lots of my patients already have pulse oxes at home, but I think that if um, having the ability to measure that and look at your oxygen saturation, which normally should be somewhere between 95 and 100, if it's getting below 95, especially when it's starting to hit 93, 92, that's when you should think about um, you know, really calling your provider and, and considering a trip to the emergency department. So I think that's a, it's a way that you can monitor at home. So thanks for bringing that up. As we conclude, I just want to give a shout out to uh, our colleague, Frank Camp. Yes. Uh, who organized this on behalf of uh, the University of Arizona. We're incredibly grateful to him, incredibly grateful to Dr. Kraft for her uh, brilliant preparation of uh, our, our presentation today. So thank you so much. And thank you. I've, I've really enjoyed doing this with you, Dr. Lee. I, we're, we're partners in this endeavor, and uh, I hope that the um, audience, uh, I think what we wanted to do is just to convey knowledge, because really at the end of the day, knowledge is power, and, and we can you know, really help ourselves and also make sure we can take care of each other, our patients, you know, our communities, our country, and our world. So um, thank you very much for doing this with me. And thanks to you, Frank, for putting us together. Thank you all. Be safe and be well. Yes, be absolutely. Bye. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. bye.